before we dive into the training, let's lay out some of the core words and concepts that drive this course. It all starts with electrical safety, the reason we're all here. The NFPA 70E defines electrical safety as identifying hazards associated with the use of electrical energy and taking precautions to reduce the risk associated with those hazards. Okay, but what's a hazard? And what makes a risk? A hazard is defined as a source of possible injury or damage to health. Like electrical shock or arc flash arc blast, by risk, we mean a combination of the likelihood of occurrence of injury or damage to health and the severity of injury or damage to health that results from a hazard. Examples of risk are burns from exposure to heat generated from an arc flash event or fatalities as a result of contacting energized equipment and receiving an electrical shock. Because electrical hazards put us at risk in the workplace, we need to protect ourselves using the control methods you'll find in the hierarchy of risk control. The hierarchy of risk control is a priority-based approach to preventative and protective measures taken to reduce or eliminate the risk of electrical injury or fatality. There are six different control methods in the hierarchy. In order of priority, they are elimination, substitution, engineering controls, awareness, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment, or PPE. EBSCO groups the top three and the bottom three into two distinct categories, inherent controls for the top and dependent controls on the bottom. Inherent controls are built right into the equipment. Dependent controls rely on worker participation to be effective. Before we know which control method to implement, we must first understand the risks associated with a given task or equipment. That brings us to the idea of risk assessment. It allows us to understand all the risks associated with specific hazards in the workplace. Risk assessment is an overall process that identifies hazards, estimates the likelihood of occurrence of injury or damage to health, estimates the potential severity of injury or damage to health, and determines if protective measures are required. Our flash studies have been a key source of information for assessing hazard severity within facilities. There are a lot of terms and concepts that come along with understanding our flash. Let's get to know them now. The incident energy calculation helps workers understand the potential severity of injury or damage to health. It's typically expressed in calories per centimeter squared. Some people say cows for short. Incident energy calculations allow us to effectively select the proper additional protective measures to suit up in the correct PPE for the task. Incident energy itself is simply a calculation of the amount of heat caused by an arc flash. Technically speaking, it's the amount of thermal energy impressed on a surface a certain distance from the source generated during an electrical arc event. Keep in mind that arc flash study alone won't estimate the likelihood of an event occurring in each specific case. What it does do is specify working boundaries. There are three you'll need to know. The arc flash boundary, the limited approach boundary, and the restricted approach boundary. Arc flash boundary is defined as when an arc flash hazard exists, an approach limit from an arc source at which incident energy equals 1.2 calories per centimeter squared. Anyone within the distance where there is an arc flash risk must be wearing the specified PPE. The other two boundaries are independent of arc flash boundary. The aim of both is to reduce the risk of electrical shock. The restricted approach boundary is the tighter boundary expressed as an approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part within which there is an increased likelihood of electrical shock due to electrical arc over combined with inadvertent movement. Only qualified personnel are allowed to cross the restricted approach boundary. 
do they need to be wearing the same properly rated electrical shock protection they would be if working directly on the equipment? The limited approach boundary is the wider, defined as an approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part within which a shock hazard exists. This boundary should never be crossed by an unqualified person unless advised of the hazards and escorted by a presently qualified individual. When you're setting up barricades, remember that the arc flash boundary is independent of the approach boundaries. Make sure your barricades meet or exceed the greatest distance listed between the arc flash and the limited approach boundaries. What counts as a barricade? A physical obstruction, such as tapes, cones, or A-frame type wood or metal structures intended to provide a warning and to limit access. Be sure to use barricades whenever an electrical hazard exists in order to warn and restrict accidental contact of unqualified and qualified individuals. Okay, you've got boundaries, but who exactly are these qualified individuals we've been talking about? By the book, a qualified person or individual is one who has demonstrated skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installation, and has received safety training to identify the hazards and reduce the associated risk. Working through that definition, you'll see three components that make a qualified person. The first is the electrical safety training your team takes at least every three years. This trains you to identify the hazards and risks associated with electricity and teaches protective measures to avoid those hazards. The second part is the individual's specific knowledge about the equipment they're working on. The third part is demonstrating that knowledge. A good way to verify how much the field staff understands about the safe work practices for their equipment is to perform an annual audit. Tools for accomplishing this will be covered in more detail with the safety manager during the administrative control section of this training. Everything we've talked about so far stems from one thing, electricity. And when we're talking about electricity, we use amps, volts, and resistance to describe it. This graphic will help you better understand those terms. Amperage is the strength of the electrical current. Volts are the agent moving the amperage through the resistance. The higher the voltage, the greater resistance it can pass through. And the greater the resistance, the less amperage. We use Ohm's law to define the relationship between the three. The equation is E over IR. Simple, right? This mathematical formula is understood as volts divided by resistance equals amps. Alternatively, amps times resistance equals volts, and volts divided by amps equals resistance. EPSCO, electrical power and safety company. Safety, diligence, collaboration.